is a uh, professor of 19th century literature and uh, culture at Yale University. And he's the author of a new book, which has just come out called The Betrayal of the Duchess, which he will talk about today in his talk about the year 1832, which um, surprised us, Maury, when we heard about it because it wasn't a year we knew about. How did you choose this year? And is, are we still in the French Revolution? Where is this year situated in kind of the scheme of things? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, let me say thanks. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And thanks to Pamela and to Simon and to Tanya for inviting me. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that if you asked uh, 100 French people what was the most important year in French history, just about zero would say 1832. Um, it's kind of halfway between the fireworks of the French Revolution and the kind of glamour of the fin de siècle period. Um, so the middle of the 19th century uh, is really the period that I think people know least about. Um, but for literature scholars, and I'm one, it's an incredibly important period. So Balzac and Stendhal invented the realist novel around 1830. Uh, and it's also the moment when the economic, political, and social changes that we call modernity, so especially the rise of industrial capitalism, really took hold in France. So that's what got me interested in it. Um, and then, or, so you wanted me to put it in historical perspective. Um, I'll do a little bit of that in the talk, but just to give a, a few dates that I think might help orient people a little bit. Um, you've got the revolution of 1789, which was the big revolution. Uh, that's the revolution that most people think of when they think of revolutions. It's the one with Marie Antoinette and the storming of the Bastille and the guillotine. Um, it's what put an end to the Bourbon monarchy, which had lasted for hundred, hundreds of years. Napoleon wrested control of the revolution and declared empire in 1804. The Napoleonic empire then lasted from 1804 until Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo in 1815. At that point, the other European powers reimposed the Bourbon monarchy on France and the brothers of Louis XVI, who had been executed, became the kings. And that period was called the Restoration. So the Restoration then lasted from 1815, from Waterloo, until the July Revolution of 1830, which brought Louis Philippe, who was a cousin of the Bourbons, but also their enemy, to power. Uh, the July Monarchy, as it was called, starts then in 1830, and that's the period I'm going to be talking about for the most part. So I'll explain uh, some of that I a little like bit more. I feel like you should turn that into a song so we can all remember it. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are the key dates, yeah. Um, all right, so do we want to maybe go to the first slide? Sure. Okay. Uh, Okay, we could even go, um, yeah, let's go to that slide, that's good. Okay, so the symptoms would come on suddenly, rumblings in the stomach, a feeling of constriction in the chest, vomiting, a burning fever, excessive thirst. Some, uh, soon the pulse would slow down, the skin would turn first red, then blue, the tongue would get cold. In the final phase, the eyes would fill with blood, and then breathing would stop. Often the whole course of the disease took just a few hours from start to finish. According to one observer, actors would collapse during the middle of a play. They were healthy one minute and a corpse the next. So this is a description of the great cholera outbreak of 1832, which was one of the worst pandemics to strike the world since the bubonic plague. And the disease really affected the whole world, but its effects were particularly intense in Paris, which was the densest city in continental Europe at the time, uh, where the overcrowded and filthy living conditions were the perfect breeding ground for a disease uh, that was caused by food and water that had been contaminated by bacteria. Um, so it's important to keep in mind, and this is gonna get a little gross, but uh, Paris was a very dirty place in 1832. 
Um, this was a time before adequate sewers and before toilets as we know them. So people would empty the contents of their chamber pots into the street, uh, which had rivers, literal rivers of muck running through them that then got tracked into people's homes. Um, anyone who wasn't rich enough to afford a carriage and had to walk in the street would then get coated with this mud that they would bring into their house. Uh, and we know that one of the main vectors of cholera was human feces that got into the water supply. Um, so pretty gross. So 20,000 Parisians died within a few months and 100,000 people died in France as a whole. Um, so if we look at this first slide here, this is a sketch by the great artist, uh, the great kind of caricature artist, Daumier. Um, we see here a man who's collapsed in the street. So he's one of those people who is probably fine one minute and then a corpse the next. You see a little bit more in the middle ground, undertakers carrying off a body uh, in the middle ground. And then what looks like a hearse in the back. Um, and then you see there a frightened woman entering her house. And I think that that frightened look that Daumier does such a good job uh, capturing is something that we can all relate to now as we walk in the street. Um, so in the early 19th century, doctors hadn't yet developed the germ theory of disease. Um, they had a sense that cholera was caused by contamination of some sort, but they thought that you could get it from breathing poisoned air. Uh, and that was the miasma theory. Um, miasmas were noxious emanations uh, from, from dirt and filth. Um, they didn't understand also that when you caught cholera, you died from dehydration. Um, so they didn't really understand how the disease worked. And the terrified, I mean, it terrified people. They grasped at all these bizarre prophylactic remedies. Uh, so my favorite one is that people were, were told to wear flannel belts to ward off danger. Um, they thought that would keep cholera at bay. Um, and of course, the government had moralistic hygiene campaigns mostly directed at the lower classes, uh, telling them to, uh, you know, advising moderation in food and drink as a preventive uh, measure. And of course, that didn't sit very well with the population that was already on the verge of starvation. Um, so they How would- How widespread was cholera, do you know? How, how widespread? Well, I mean, we know that, um, as I said, something like 20,000 people out of about 650,000 people in Paris died from it. Um, so it was pretty widespread. Um, and there, there was nothing they could do. There were no, so it's a little, you know, it's, it's sort of similar, in fact, you know, to our um, current pandemic, but the, the death, you know, it was much, much more deadly um, than what we're going through now, luckily. Um, so the bodies were piling up. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about what happened in 1832 in France as either a direct or an indirect result of the pandemic. Um, so I want to suggest that this pandemic had major repercussions for French history and that its effects are being felt today still. And I want to point out that, you know, there are really some amazing parallels between what happened in 1832 and some of what we're living through today. So why don't we go to the next slide here? Okay. So the first point I want to make is that cholera exacerbated social and political tensions that had been brewing in France for a while. So the 1830s, uh, as I said a minute ago, were really the period, it was really the period that saw the Industrial Revolution get underway in France. Uh, France was actually a little behind England when it came to the Industrial Revolution because of all the political unrest. But by the 1830s, factories were growing more numerous and had begun drawing huge numbers of poor people from the countryside to Paris to work in them. Um, and this urban proletariat lived a very precarious existence. So today, uh, France is known for its generous social safety net. Uh, we think of like the 35-hour work week. 
But it's important to keep in mind that in the 19th century, uh, Paris, you know, France was really the center of capitalist exploitation. Because like with all these workers to choose from, factory owners could pay very little in salary. And sometimes workers had to pay like half of their weekly wages just for food. Uh, and if people, if like the man couldn't go to work because he was sick, the family literally starved. Um, so all these workers needed someplace to live and rents in Paris went through the roof at this time. Um, especially in the poor central areas in, in the middle of the city. So the poorest areas where people were crowded in, it's a little hard to imagine if you know Paris now because these are very fancy areas, but the Ile de la Cité, the area around the Hôtel de Ville and the Bastille neighborhood, uh, so the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, were the centers of these like overcrowded slums. Um, where people had to like crowd into tiny garrets like in the attic and that's what we see in this picture here like a poor family living in uh, an attic. The rich meanwhile fled these central neighborhoods uh, for the newer cleaner districts that were being developed in the north and the west of Paris. So the class divide was becoming a geographic divide. And cholera made this divide much worse. So part of the problem was that the poor seemed to be dying in much greater numbers than the rich. And this was because, like today, a lot of rich people fled to their country homes. Um, and there was also just much less density in the, in the rich neighborhoods than in the poor ones. Uh, so these overcrowded slums in the center of the city were breeding grounds for disease. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that in the 19th century, you really did not want to go to the hospital. So hospitals often doubled as poor houses, insane asylums, even prisons. Anyone who could afford to wanted to stay at home when they got sick. So when municipal authorities started carting off cholera victims to the giant hospital in the center of the city, the Hotel Dieu, uh, they did that to contain the contagion. The masses started to panic. Uh, rumors began to spread that cholera was a conspiracy to rid the city of its poorest residents. Um, so you have a situation here where the rich thought that the poor were spreading disease and the poor thought that the rich were trying to poison them. Um, so it was really, there was a lot of kind of class it animosity. It's so familiar. It's like we haven't advanced at all. I know, I know. Especially the part about, you know, people fleeing to their country houses. <laughs> um, so government leaders uh, made things much worse. Again, things have not a lot has changed. Uh, so the prefect of police of, of, in Paris was a guy named Henri Gisquet, uh, and he tried to quell the rumors that the rich, uh, that the you know officials were poisoning the poor, by putting out a statement that although they weren't poisoning the wells on purpose, it's possible that criminals were doing so. Um, and this had just like the, the exact wrong effect. So he was trying to kind of quell these rumors and instead he, he made everyone panic. Violence ensued here um, and the newspapers at the time are full of stories of mobs attacking people who they thought were trying to poison the wells. Um, and, Do you want me to move uh, forward in the yeah. slides? Uh, yeah, let's move to the next slide. So a lot of the people's anger focused on the king, on Louis Philippe. Uh, that's this guy in the slide. Um, a little background on Louis Philippe here. Um, before he became king of the French in 1830, he was the Duke of Orléans. He was a cousin of the Bourbon royal family. His father uh, was known as Philippe Égalité, so Philippe Equality. Uh, he was one of the highest nobles in France, but he sympathized with the French Revolution and he voted for the execution of Louis XVI before he himself also got executed. 
but the Bourbons never let him forget it, um, never let his son forget it. So when the Bourbons came back to power in 1815, during the restoration, they constantly looked for ways to snub Louis Philippe. Uh, although Louis Philippe owned the Palais Royal, which was this kind of premier entertainment destination in Paris. So he was the, one of the richest people in France and he had a lot of power. He was also more liberal than the Bourbons. Um, so the Bourbons were trying, during the restoration, were trying to pretend like the revolution had never taken place. Uh, they restored power to the nobles and to the Catholic Church. Um, they were slowly trying to bring back absolute monarchy in France, despite the fact that there was technically now a, during the restoration, a constitution limiting their powers. But in the 1820s, Charles X, who was the last Bourbon king, went a little too far by curtailing freedom of the press. And that sparked the July Revolution of 1830. Um, for a minute, it looked like they would, the revolutionaries would be able to start a republic again, like they had done during the first revolution. But they wound up accepting a compromise, which was Louis Philippe, who was seen as more liberal than the Bourbons. He was kind of a middle of the road uh, compromise. And he became king in 1830, as I said, at the start of the July monarchy. But pretty quickly, it became clear that nobody liked Louis Philippe. Uh, he was really only supported by this small group of bankers and businessmen. Uh, supporters of the Bourbons, who were on the right of the political spectrum, hated him because he had usurped the crown from the, the legitimate monarchs. Supporters of a republic on the left and the working class hated him because he had usurped the revolution. And journalists hated him uh, because he had reimposed censorship. Um, and if we move to the next slide here. Um, so uh, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, images here. So a particularly malicious journalist uh, drew a caricature comparing Louis Philippe's head to a pear. Uh, and this became all the rage um, in the early 1830s. So if you wanted to criticize Louis Philippe, you would just draw a pair. And there were pairs on all the walls of Paris uh, in 1832. So the cholera epidemic really brought all of these simmering tensions and all of this hatred against Louis Philippe to a boil. Um, and a lot of the anger focused on Louis Philippe's prime minister, who was this guy named Casimir Perrier. Uh, he was a banker and he owned mines and he, he really like reinforced the perception that Louis Philippe's government was being run by the rich, uh, for the rich. Uh, he, Perrier, had repressed a major strike by silk workers the previous year. So the poor people really and the working class hated him uh, and the feeling was mutual here. So if we move to the next slide. <clears throat> All right, so this is a painting uh, by the artist Tony Joanneau, uh, and it shows Louis Philippe's son, who's the guy in red pants in the middle. Uh, he was the Duke of Orléans, visiting cholera victims at the Hôtel Dieu. If you notice uh, to his right, I guess that is in the painting, is this guy in black with a white collar, and that's Perrier. Uh, that's the prime minister. He's looking very uncomfortable, uh, surrounded by all these poor cholera victims uh, who, were, who hated him and who were plotting a revolution. Um, so uh, two weeks after this visit to uh, the cholera victims, Perrier came down with cholera and died. Um, he got a big state funeral uh, by Louis Philippe. And that really angered the lower classes. Um, so two weeks after Perrier's funeral, General Lamarck died. And if we go to the next slide. So General Lamarck was a hero of the Napoleonic Wars. He had spoken out against the Bourbons' reactionary policies during the Restoration. So the common people loved him. He was a hero. 
and they were furious with Louis Philippe uh, that he was not given a state funeral when like the, the guy they hated, Perrier, was treated, you know, like a hero. So the Republicans, and when I say Republicans, it's important to keep in mind, it's not like American Republicans. These were the people on the left who wanted to bring back a republic. Um, they decided to use Lamarck's funeral as like the pretext to launch another revolution to bring down Louis Philippe's government. So they hijacked his hearse and they tried to carry it, the, the coffin, to the Pantheon, which is where France traditionally buries its great men. Mm -hmm. So the government uh, panicked. They tried to disperse the crowd. And pretty soon, barricades went up throughout Paris. And another insurrection had started. Um, so barricade fighting is kind of interesting. So barricade fighting is what we most associate with all these revolutions in, in Paris. Um, barricades were basically anything that could be jumbled together to form a barrier to block the army from attacking. So overturned carriages, wagons, even furniture. People would throw their furniture out of their apartment windows into the street and they would form these barricades. Um, barricades were not impregnable, though, so the government could usually fire cannons that would destroy them. But they were pretty effective in slowing down government forces, uh, especially the cavalry, um, which was used as a kind of form of crowd control. So these, these barricades were pretty useful for like this guerrilla warfare in the streets. But in 1832, so unlike in 1789, where the barricades really worked, and unlike 1830, where they worked, this uprising of 1832 failed. Um, and this was mainly because the people of Paris did not rally to the government's, uh, I mean, to the insurgents' side. They mostly stayed at home and closed their shutters. Um, and after a day of fighting, government troops smashed through the barricades, killing hundreds of the insurgents. And Louis Philippe would stay in power for um, like 16 more years. Um, and this is actually like, I think one of the kind of maybe scary lessons for us now of 1832, which is that um, incumbents, I think, have an advantage during a pandemic. So people, I think, even though they didn't like Louis Philippe, they, they stuck with the devil they knew. Um, so this left-wing revolt, though, had a pretty long afterlife. Uh, first of all, literarily, because it becomes the centerpiece of Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables. Mm. So people, a lot of people I talk to think that that novel is set during the French Revolution. It's not. It's actually set during this relatively obscure revolt in 1832. Um, and if I have, we have a clip here, if we want to show a few minutes of this clip, this is from the BBC, the recent BBC adaptation of Les Mis, and it shows the moment when government troops overwhelm the barricade. So we have Marius, who's the young hero, who feels he has nothing left to lose because he's lost his love, Cosette, and he threatens to blow himself up uh, to stop the soldiers. Victor Hugo would make this minor failed revolt the centerpiece of his novel. Um, and I think one of the main reasons is that it helped plant the seed for change. So even though this revolt failed, uh, it did eventually plant the seeds of revolution that uh, eventually worked in 1848. They brought down Louis Philippe. There was a short-lived republic. And then in 1870, there was a much longer lasting one. So this failed uprising caused by cholera really set in motion a process that would eventually lead to democracy and to freedom and to a better world. So for the final part of the talk, I want to discuss another event from 1832. Uh, one that has largely been forgotten, uh, and that's the uprising by the far right led by the Duchesse de Berry. And this is what my new book is about. So if we go to the next slide. 
Yeah. Okay. So there's the cover of my new book. Um, it shows the Duchesse de Berry. She was the glamorous four foot seven daughter-in-law of Charles X, the last Bourbon King, who was ousted by the Revolution of 1830. Uh, she was the mother of the 11-year-old heir to the throne, Henri. Uh, he was born eight months after her husband was assassinated in 1820. Uh, if we go to the next slide, there's the Duchess with her son. So after the revolution of 1830, uh, when the rest of the Bourbon family was licking its wounds in exile and cursing Louis Philippe, their cousin, the Duchess began plotting to reconquer the French throne for her son. Uh, so from the small Italian seaside town of Massa, she assembled a small army of partisans, uh, but she had a, a hard time deciding when to launch her invasion. So some advisors told her to set sail immediately, that every minute she didn't was a minute she had robbed from, from the reign of her son. Um, and they made it sound like the whole country couldn't wait to rise up to bring back the Bourbons. Other advisors, including the writer Chateaubriand, were more cautious. Uh, they knew it would be hard to defeat Louis Philippe's army without foreign intervention. Um, and they worried that a defeat would mean the end of hopes of ever restoring the Bourbon monarchy. Um, they also worried that she would be put to death if she tried something and failed. So it was the cholera epidemic, again, that pushed her to launch her invasion. So for the Duchess and her right-wing supporters, the disease seemed like God's punishment for 50 years of revolution in France. So they believed that only a return to the traditional Bourbon monarchy and to the hardline Catholicism that underpinned that monarchy could restore health to the nation. So that was the Duchess's message. And to her, the disease seemed like a sign from God that her time had come. So she set sail, landed in Marseille during the night of April 30th, 1832, as the disease raged. Her hope was that the people of Marseille would take up arms on her behalf, but it didn't really happen. Um, so she was watching from a hillside overlooking Marseille as her soldiers tried to start this rebellion, but everything went wrong. Uh, they couldn't find the key to the belfry, then they were supposed to ring the bell to signal the start of the rebellion. They couldn't find the key. They also started the rebellion in the middle of the night when everyone was asleep. So the whole thing failed. Uh, she gets a message the next morning saying that the rebellion has failed. Um, she probably should have just slipped out of France uh, at that point. But she was this courageous soul, and instead, she decides to kind of double down, and she makes her way to the far west of France, to the old province uh, known as the Vendée, where there was a small army of nobles and peasants waiting to take up arms. So dressed as a peasant boy, uh, she slept in haylofts and barns, uh, as she, and she commanded a guerrilla army of soldiers uh, in a series of battles against Louis Philippe's troops uh, during the early summer of 1832. So things did not go particularly well. Uh, her uprising was really doomed by like miscommunications. There were all these like letters in invisible ink that didn't get to the right people in time. Uh, pretty soon she was forced to go into hiding in Nantes. Uh, so by June she was in hiding. Uh, and then she was eventually betrayed by her trusted confidant, Simon Deutz. And if we go to the next image. So Deutz was a pretty interesting character. Uh, and my new book is really a double biography of Deutz and the Duchess. He was the son of the chief rabbi of France. But in 1828, he converted to Catholicism. And it was such a big deal that the son of Francis' chief rabbi had converted that the Pope invited him to Rome and put him on the Vatican's payroll. And the Vatican, the Pope actually introduced him personally to the Duchess as someone she could trust as she planned her invasion. So 
at first he did perform a series of kind of delicate missions for her, but then when it seemed like her campaign was gonna fail, he switched sides and he offered to lead the police to where she was hiding in Nantes. And this betrayal really set off what was the first anti-Semitic affair in modern French history. So even though Deutz had converted and was technically not Jewish anymore, the far right supporters of the Duchess blamed his treachery on his Jewish origins and blamed all the Jews for the action of this one guy. All the major newspapers uh, at the time covered this case in obsessive detail and all the major writers, so everyone in Chateaubriand, Alexandre Dumas, uh, even Victor Hugo wrote a viciously anti-Semitic poem about Deutz's betrayal of the Duchess. So in my book, I try to show that the betrayal was the moment that anti-Semitism became a key part of right-wing ideology in France. And it did so because the story of the betrayal, and I'm almost done here, the story of the betrayal offered those who felt displaced by all the changes that France was undergoing. So that transition to modernity, it gave them a way to explain what was going wrong. So they weren't unemployed and angry and starving because of industrialization or because of changes to the economy. It was because a Jew had betrayed the mother of France's rightful king. So she was brave and virtuous. He was greedy and deceitful. And this affair really turned the struggle over modernity into a kind of passion play with the Jew as villain. So that's another way uh, that the events of 1832 had a lasting impact. I try to argue in the book that this affair set the tone for a century of anti-Semitism to come. And I'll, I'll stop there and uh, we can open it up to questions. Uh, people, thank you very, very much, Maury. People do submit your questions over chat. Um, I know that we already have a couple in, but please keep going. Just write it to everyone and we'll ask them. I, I have an, oh, sorry, did you have Go on, no, go on, Pamela. <laughs> oh, I, I just had an opening question, Maury, about Le Miserable, which is a, a book I have to admit I, I've never read. Um, I, it's, I, I know you're now teaching a class on the book. Is this a book that you would, that, that you like, that you would recommend that, that non-specialists read? Oh my God, yes. Okay, so I can't really recommend it enough. And it's always a book, I had read it, but it's a book that I, I find it hard to teach because it's really long, it's 1300 pages. So, you know, you can't give it to students in a week and say, you know, uh, here, read this. Um, and it was, um, so I finally decided just this year for the first time to devote a whole class to the book. So we read a hundred pages of it a week. And, um, you know, it, it was kind of like not my type of book. I'm much more partial to realist novels, um, to Balzac it's novels. Very moralizing. It's all about how the poor are downtrodden and they're the victim. Yeah, and it's like very melodramatic and it's very, you know, idealist where you have these, you know, very moral characters like Jean Valjean. But it's an, an incredible novel that gives you like a complete panorama of French history in the 19th century. So the book is really great for its digressions, especially. So he talks about everything from like slang to like the Battle of Waterloo to like how sewers function. So it's like an incredible cultural history. Someone is recommending the translation by Julie Rose. That's the one I used, as a matter of fact. Yes, oh, okay, I think it's great. a really good trans, uh, translation. And I have to say, I'll, I'll put in a plug for that BBC adaptation. So nothing is a substitute for the novel, but that adaptation is pretty close to the novel. So I, I like it. Uh, Mari, I also wanted to ask about Victor Hugo. He seems to have this very special place in French sentiment. So his funeral was a mass event many years later. Um, Le Mis remains a kind of iconic story, even to people who've never read it, watched yeah. it. Why do you think he, he still has this meaning? Yeah, so um, he, 
he was the towering genius of the 19th century. So in every genre, and that's something that people, you know, so he wrote one of the most famous novels of all time. He was also considered the best poet at, you know, the, that France had ever known. Um, but he was even most famous for his plays. So he was really famous in every genre. Um, and, but I, I would point out that uh, something I mentioned in the talk that was probably, you know, one of the most surprising things as I wrote this book, that, you know, we think of Hugo as this defender of the downtrodden, and he, he took this very moral stance in the 19th century. He defended, he was an opponent of the death penalty. He was a big supporter of the poor. Um, during the Second Empire, he went into a principled exile uh, during the whole Second Empire. But during the case uh, that I was talking about, the arrest of the Duchess, he wrote this viciously anti-Semitic poem uh, about Deutz. And that was one of the most surprising things that I try to explore, like why he would have done that uh, in, in, the, in the book. And he was, you know, unfortunately not immune to seeing this case through the lens of anti-Semitism. So blaming Deutz's treachery on, he wasn't just a bad guy, like there were a lot of bad guys, he did it, you know, because of his Jewishness. So how, in your class on the Miserable, how do you, how do you grapple with that? Well, I didn't basically, I didn't really talk about that poem. Uh, we did talk about, you know, um, all kinds of other, you know, social battles that he, he fought and he was almost always on the right side of things, uh, but not, not there. I don't know, we've had a lot of very good questions from the audience. Do you want to uh, ask Go a couple ahead. of questions Please. from the chat? Um, yeah, I mean, this uh, one question from Gina Schmeling is, is this the first instance of anti-Semitism being a weapon of nationalism? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, anti-Semitism obviously predates the 19th century. It's, you know, uh, one scholar calls it the, the oldest hatred. But it's important to keep in mind that anti-Semitism mutates through history. So it means different things in different periods. Um, you know, speaking very generally in the, you know, pre-modern period, it's mainly religious in focus, although it always has an, um, uh, an economic aspect too because of the specific economic roles that Jews filled or were forced to fill um, through the ages. But in the 19th century, um, it does start to, um, as I argue, it becomes a way uh, for people to make sense of modernity, um, for people to explain everything that was scary about the modern world. And it's also to answer the question, the 19th century is also the era of nationalism. So after Waterloo, after 1815, you start to get um, nations thinking of themselves as nations um, and being opposed to each other as nations. And Jews became an easy way for people to define who they were by uh, saying who they weren't. And there were Jews in all of these countries uh, that became the other. So they became who uh, nations define themselves against. This was also, it's important to point out though, that this was the period when Jews really became citizens for the first time. So it's a complicated thing. And France was the first country to make Jews citizens during the French Revolution in 1791. So Jews were becoming part of the nation and they thought of themselves as part of the nation, but you start to get, especially on the right wing, uh, people who were trying to you know, create a form of nationalism by excluding the Jews. Um, Mari, Laura von Sarsen asks, uh, why is this whole story of the Duchess largely forgotten? It doesn't seem to figure greatly in literature, whereas uh, the Dreyfus Affair very much is the anti-Semitic story about France that people know. And this links also to a question perhaps from Robbie Baxter about why did you pick her, the Duchess? Yeah, so um, I partly picked her because the story had been forgotten, um, you know, for the most part. So that it's always, you know, good as a, as a cultural historian to pick on something that a lot of people haven't written about. I think probably one of the reasons that um, the story, it, for, it's important to keep in mind, and I do this at the end of the book, I trace the history of the memory of this affair. So it was really in the forefront of people's memories 
through the Dreyfus Affair, it was mentioned hundreds of times in the press during the Dreyfus Affair, and really up through World War II and Vichy. It surfaces at times of um, rampant anti-Semitism. But after World War II, anti-Semitism went out of fashion in France um, until pretty recently, until, you know, let's say around 2000. And I think this story kind of fell out of uh, people's consciousness because of that. I think that for a lot of pretty obvious reasons, Jewish historians were reluctant to talk about this case because unlike Dreyfus, who was innocent and who was a model victim of anti-Semitism, Deutz was not a very sympathetic character. He did betray the Duchess. He was a kind of lying scoundrel. Um, but I think that it's important to understand, you know, to, to understand his story because it was so important for the formation of anti-Semitism. So we can't just dismiss the parts of history we don't like, or we can't, like there, the, some of the few Jewish historians who've tried to talk about the case have done it by defending him or saying he didn't really do it. He did do it. What's important to keep in mind is that he didn't do it because he was Jewish. And so, you know, that's what people said at the time. And that's what I try to explain at this case. This is how anti-Semitism functions. It extrapolates from, you know, what some people do to what a whole people, um, blaming a whole people. So I think that's one of the reasons that it, it fell out of favor um, and fell out of, you know, people's consciousness. We have a nice comment from Janie Kritzman. Louis-Philippe, after the 1789 revolution, I guess, uh, came to Boston and worked at the Union Oyster House as a waiter. And then there's a question on a different aspect from Doug Herbert. Osman's transformation of Paris in the mid 19th century was mostly about crowd control, where he builds the big boulevards so that the police can shoot cannons down. Yeah. But was he also worried about hygiene, about another cholera outbreak in kind of destroying the slums and building the boulevard? Yeah, completely. So, um, yeah, that this is important to keep in mind that the Paris that we think of today, this Paris of long, straight boulevards and, you know, monuments set off at the end of them, uh, was a product of the Second Empire. So really from the 1850s and 60s. The period that I'm talking about in the 1830s, Paris was still pretty much a medieval city with these small, narrow streets where it was easy to build barricades. And people argue that, as the, the questioner you know, pointed out, that one of the big goals of Napoleon III uh, during the Second Empire was to prevent barricades from being able to be built. So crowd control. And that was one of the reasons he widened the streets. Uh, but he also undertook a major hygiene campaign. Uh, he vastly expanded the sewer system of France. Um, and expand, you know, had running water became much more common at this period. He also created many more parks and green spaces uh, that really did. So people have a tendency, I think, to be down on Napoleon III and what they call housemanization because his, the prefect of the Seine who undertook the reconstruction of the Paris was named Hausman. Um, people think that it, you know, destroyed the charming old neighborhoods in the center, uh, that it furthered that process of displacing poor people from the city center to the outskirts, and it definitely did do that. It was definitely in service of the bourgeoisie and of, of capitalism, but it also, you know, had some positive um, effects also, mainly through hygiene and public health. Right here now in Paris, uh, they are installing soap dispensers all over the place. Uh, in the metro, you're going to have to wear a mask from when Paris starts reopening on May 11th. So we're in that same phase again. Camille Landau asks, if you were to write another version of the book, would you focus on the cholera COVID angle now, if you were writing now? Yeah, well, I do, uh, <laughs> I do have a whole chapter, chapter seven, for those of you who want to skip ahead, which is uh, all about cholera. Oh, and she, it looks like she has it right there. She has the book. Okay, thank you. Um, so chapter seven is about cholera. Yeah, I probably would have maybe made it a little bit more about cholera um, now, because I have to say that aspect of it has been really fascinating now to see uh, especially, I think, the social effects of um, 
pandemics, and it's not that different. So the way uh, it exacerbated class tensions uh, between rich and poor, um, all the ways that the government mishandled the, the um, cholera pandemic at the time, we see those exact same things. So peddling these false remedies, um, you know, rewarding your uh, political allies and punishing your enemies, all these things were mistakes that Louis Philippe made that unfortunately are being uh, made again. Randy Renato has a question also about COVID cholera. Uh, thinking about art's current role during this time, can you speak to the role of art in 1832 and then maybe now during this epidemic? Yeah, so um, the, uh, you know, one of the most famous works of art from this time is um, uh, the um, Liberty Leading the People. So I don't know if you guys, I wish I had that on a slide right now. I don't, I apologize. Um, so this is Delacroix's famous painting. And if you can maybe picture it of um, a barricade and you have um, a woman where her dress has kind of fallen down, one breast is exposed. On one side, she has a worker and on the other side, a bourgeois, like a middle-class person, and they're storming the barricade. This is the most famous image of eight of the revolution of 1830. Um, so this, you know, is a, um, an image that has had a long afterlife in France and it's a kind of symbol of revolutionary, um, uh, cooperation among classes, which was a little bit of an idealist vision. Um, so there were, uh, you know, that image that I did show of Daumier. Uh, Daumier, I, I can't recommend enough um, as a kind of social commentator of this period. So his um, caricatures are really, I think, one of the best forms of social history at this time and a, a real, um, he, he's fantastic at kind of um, puncturing the pompous uh, bourgeoisie at the time and kind of skewering political leaders. Uh, so I highly recommend him and I think that his art played a huge role in um, uh, and you know art in general and this was one of the reasons for those pair caricatures so that I mentioned before. Um, what happened was, is Louis Philippe, uh, there was a law saying that you could not make fun of the king um, at the time. So you couldn't insult the king in any way. And this guy, Philippon, uh, who was a, uh, ran the most important caricature journal, uh, was brought up on charges. And he tried to argue that that's an impossible law because anything could be made to look like the king. And his example of that was a pear. And that's what got, uh, you know, everyone did, everyone started to realize that, in fact, Louis Philippe did look suspiciously like a pear. Um, well, Macron's in good shape because he doesn't seem to resemble any known fruit as far yeah. as. <laughs> exactly. You know? Well, I, I think we're going to have to end pretty soon. Okay. Um, a couple other great Trump, comments. Trump does re resemble an orange, though. So maybe. Yeah, maybe. I was going to say the color yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. We should all start painting oranges on the walls in America. Um, so uh, some other great suggestions that uh, you should turn the Duchess story into a screenplay or at least sell it to someone else who will do that for you. <laughs> um, and definitely for the paperback, put pandemic in the title. Yeah. Right? Just in yeah. The title. So um, unfortunately, we have to end here. Maury, thank you so much for sharing your deep knowledge of this really fascinating period with us. I, I think some of us will go out, if not, to read Les Mis, at least to watch the hour and a half version um, on television. So